through Lego Storytime. I was adding little bits to Lego Storytime and then I suddenly realised the time and had to stop myself. It'll be worth it. Lego Storytime's definitely better now than it was 15 minutes ago. Alliance. Yeah, got my spooky dress on. I'm very excited about this. Uh, right, I usually faff for ages, don't I? But I think we're just going to get going, you know? Is that too weird? <coughs> yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to flip you. I'll cough and then I'll flip you. <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> okay, right. Flipping you round. Do, 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 do. Hello, Science Alliance. Hello. If you're watching this on Catch Up, it's um, half term for me next week. And during half term is Halloween and Guy Fawkes Night, Bonfire Night. It's why I'm wearing my new spooky dress. So uh, I've already written a science magazine about Guy Fawkes, which some of you have got. I'll probably bring it out again for my supporters. So I didn't want to just look at like the science of Guy Fawkes. We've done the science of um, fireworks. I thought, we'll just look at, at sort of the time that Guy Fawkes was alive. So I've called this show The Science of the 1600s. It's more, it's more the very late 1500s into the early 1600s and then some stuff about the Royal Society. That wasn't a very catchy title though. Right, you know that I like to go right back to the beginning when I'm learning about stuff. So we, uh, we do a lot of lessons where we look at animals and we go right back to like how they evolved and how they categorised. This one's about history, so I just wanted to go like right back in time and look at why Guy Fawkes tried to blow up the House of Parliament. Uh, yeah, so it's not exactly a story time. I mean, there are pictures, and I guess it is a story. Anyway, have a look, have a look at this. Here we go. This is taking a very long run up. <laughs> so it's 1516 where we will start. Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon are married and they have a child. Mary. You ready to watch Catherine of Aragon have a child? There we go. Whee! There she is. Um, okay, and they are all Catholics, so everything's fine. They're a happy little family. I mean, Mary could have been a boy. That would have been better. But apart from that, everything's great. And then Henry VIII meets someone called Anne Boleyn. <gasps> and he likes her a lot. Oh, no, come on, PowerPoint. Oh, I'd spent ages on these little speech bubbles and my PowerPoint has been a bit sticky recently. Sorry, Mary, you're going to have to be given birth to again. Here's Anne Boleyn. And yeah, that's what I wanted. Henry VIII is like, ooh. So Henry VIII goes to the head of the Catholic Church, who is the Pope, and says, can I divorce my wife, Catherine, and marry Anne? And the Pope says, no, no, you can't. That's not how Catholicism works. No, you're married now forever. Um, and Henry's like, well, fine then I will make myself the head of the Catholic Church in England. You remember the word heresy? When we looked at Galileo Galilei, he, he said some things that might have suggested that the Bible was wrong. That is heresy. Um, so Henry VIII is like, well, I think you're a heretic, the Pope, and I'm going to take over Catholicism in my country. I'm going to give it a different name. We're all going to be Protestants now, and I'm going to close all the monasteries where Catholic people are living and take all their money. And he's like, and if they don't like it, they can die. And he does. He just takes down a lot of monasteries and he, he does kill a lot of Catholics. Not a nice time to be a Catholic. Now Henry VIII is uh, not a Catholic anymore. He basically invents a new religion, the Protestant religion, that everyone has to follow. So obviously he, he then can get divorced because he is in charge of his religion. So Henry marries Anne Boleyn. So sorry, Catherine of Aragon, you are no more. And they have a child, Elizabeth. Here's Anne Boleyn giving birth to Elizabeth. She's got legs. She takes after her dad. And obviously Elizabeth is a Protestant, right? Now, because her dad's Protestant, so she is a Protestant. <clears throat> right. Henry gets bored of Anne Boleyn. It's a pretty famous story. Uh, and he marries again. And he has another son, Edward. Ooh. So when Henry dies in 1547, Edward, because he's a boy, he becomes the king. If you're looking at this picture of Edward and thinking, he looks young. Yeah, he was nine when he became king. 
Um, and after six years, he dies. So then, the, obviously, after Edward dies, the next person in line for the throne is Mary, because she's the eldest child of the person who was just king. Um, but unfortunately, well, there's a bit of skullduggery going on. She's a Catholic, and that's, that's not good in these times. Um, and also, Edward has sort of been persuaded by someone who's related to someone called Lady Jane Grey, um, that he should like basically say that he wants his Protestant cousin, Lady Jane Grey, to be queen. So, um, yeah, Lady Jane Grey, who sort of no one's ever heard of, but she's a Protestant and she's vaguely related to Edward. She then comes on the phone. This is the ghost of Edward saying, ha ha, Mary, you can't be queen. So Lady Jane Grey does get made the queen. She's 16. This is so sad. Um, she, she gets made queen, but Mary and Elizabeth nope this very hard and ride into London on horses to claim the throne. And Jane Grey has her head chopped off. Here is an incredible painting. It wasn't painted at the time. It was painted quite a bit later, but it's, a, it's the most famous picture of Jane Grey because look at it. It's blooming heartbreaking. Look how she's all dressed in white, like she's completely innocent. She's all lit up beautifully. These women who have no power because they're women, it's the 1500s, are absolutely distraught. She's, look at her face, like she's so confused, isn't she? She's got no malice or badness in her. She's just like, oh, okay, that's what you need to do. Even the person who's supposed to be chopping her head off is looking very reluctant to do the job. Um, so if, if you're ever in a pub quiz, Mary, uh, Jane Grey is queen for nine days, which is the shortest amount of time anyone has ever ruled England. Oh, right. Anyway, Mary is uh, the first proper queen of England. I didn't know this. So she claims the throne. She's sort of with Elizabeth, like they're, they're not on bad terms, but she's the eldest. So she becomes queen. Yeah, she's the first queen of England who isn't queen just because she's married to a king. Like she's the actual proper queen on her own. And she rules for five years. She's got, she gets the nickname Bloody Mary. Do you remember the very beginning of the story? Mary is a Catholic, right? So all the Catholics in Britain are very pleased that there's now a Catholic royal back on the throne because she was the first daughter when Henry was still a Catholic. Um, so she burns 280 Protestants at the stake because now Protestant is the wrong answer. Now we're in a Catholic country and the Protestants are heretics. Um, she does other stuff too, but it's the burning the Protestants thing that really sticks in people's minds, which is why her nickname is Bloody Mary. And she dies in 1558. And finally, Queen Elizabeth becomes Queen Elizabeth. So she's a Protestant, remember? So now we've got a country where there are Catholics and there are Protestants. Protestants who are looking forward to getting all protestant -y again, and Catholics who've been having a really nice time with Mary, the Catholic Queen. So Elizabeth, she does try to compromise at first. Um, she's like, oh, don't worry, Catholics, you can still wear the clothes that you like to wear, and you can still do your kind of communion with the wafers and the wine. We'll have two communions. Um, but obviously the Pope is Catholic and is still around, and France and Spain are both Catholic countries, and... Elizabeth is very worried that she's going to get basically like invaded by uh, and, and taken over by Catholic plots. And the Pope just kind of openly says like, get her everyone um, and send spies over to try and convert people in the country to being Catholics again. Um, she, she starts up all kinds of laws because she's very worried saying, right, Catholics, if you don't come to Protestant church services, I'm going to fine you like thousands of pounds in today's money. And there genuinely are a lot of Protestants a lot of Catholics plotting against her. So yeah, th things get bad. She tries to stamp down on Catholicism, which obviously makes the Catholics even more angry. Um, and then it gets towards the end of her reign and Elizabeth hasn't had any children or got married. So people start saying to her, who do you want to be king or queen after you? But she's not saying, quite sensibly. Um, the king of Scotland is James. He's related to Elizabeth and he's a Protestant and he's a man, so perfect. Uh, so Elizabeth's advisors start writing to him in secret. And when she finally dies, hooray, we're in the 1600s, in 1603, James takes over, right? Um, and James might be a Protestant, but actually his mum was a Catholic and his wife has converted to Catholicism. So the Catholics in England are like, okay, this is all right. 
He's a Protestant, but he's probably going to be pretty sympathetic. Things are probably going to get better. We're not going to be fined thousands of pounds anymore or killed for thinking the wrong thing. Catholics are wrong about this. James is also worried about Catholic plots and is not very sympathetic towards the Catholics. And you, you possibly know that at this point, Guy Fawkes, and I mean, actually, Guy Fawkes isn't really the leader of the gunpowder pot. He's the one that knows about gunpowder. You can read about that on the internet. Um, but yeah, a whole gang of people are like, right, we've had enough of this. Catho Catholics have had a bad time in England for too long. We thought James was going to be different. He's not. We're just going to blow him up and start again and put somebody Catholic on the throne. Which is why in uh, 1605, Guy Fawkes is discovered. Fun fact. It wasn't in the basement of the House of Parliament. It's just a room on the ground floor. But he's got loads of gunpowder and, you know, some what at the time were matches and he's about to light them and blow up King James. So that is why. So that leads us to science in the 1600s. There's a lot going on. That's why Catholics and Protestants get mentioned a lot when you're talking about the 1600s. Um, also, coffee is introduced in, into Britain at this time, which for me, I feel like would have a more dramatic impact on my life. Um, what was science like before the 1600s? And then we'll do some activity about it. So we've talked about how uh, the Greeks, ancient Greek, wrote a lot of fantastic ideas down and then the Islamic Empire in the medieval times found the Greek books and rewrote them into Arabic and added their own ideas. And then when the um, Arabic Empire fell, the Islamic Empire, Europe got hold of some of those books that were, had Greek ideas in and got really excited and translated those into Latin. So basically, in the early 1600s, everyone is all about all about Greece. Here's a picture from Aristotle's book. So we've got Earth in the centre of the universe and everything going around the Earth. This is a very popular idea. We looked at it when we looked at the Galileo show. This is another thing that they believed. This is Zodiac Man. People used to believe that different parts of your body were like somehow connected to the stars and that if you were feeling ill or you had a problem with a bit of your body, it might be because the stars were doing something interesting. If you like Shakespeare, Shakespeare was around and died in 1616. You hear a lot of stuff in his plays about the four humours. This was another Greek idea. Hippocrates, the Greek, had come up with the idea about if you were ill, maybe there was too much blood in your body and you had to get the blood out, too much bile in your body. It was all incorrect. But that's because they didn't have science in those days. So the 1600s is when people stop just believing everything they read in the books by the Greeks and the Romans and start practicing science themselves. Let's do the activity, because I've talked a lot. Right, to do this activity, you need a candle and a plate and a jar and some water and some way of lighting the candle. So if, you're not used, if you don't usually deal with fire, don't deal with it now while you're watching me. Get an adult to do it, all right? Um, I've just realized I have mislaid my jar. Right, so anyway, light your candle. I'll go and get my jar. We're looking a little, we've gone a little bit later now. We've passed a whole civil war, which is my favorite bit of history. We'll do a whole science show on the civil war. We're in um, 1660 and the Royal Society has been founded. There's a bit of that in story time. But one of the members of the very important Royal Society, all these scientists, wise, interested people, get together to talk about the world. One of those scientists is Robert Boyle, who is very famous uh, for inventing a pump that can take air out of a jar. It's a vacuum pump, so you, you get a vacuum where there's no air particles. And he did loads of cool experiments with what happens when there are no air particles around, which no one had ever really done before. Right, I'm gonna go and find my jar. <laughs> I didn't do this on Facebook yesterday. Didn't do this on Facebook yesterday, but I'm gonna do the small version of this activity and then I'm gonna do a big activity just to see what happens. Okay, so you have to pour some water onto the plate. I've put food colouring in my water so that you can see it more easily. You don't have to, but you can if you like. And then you just put uh, uh, the jar over the candle and see what happens. So let's do it. What do you think is going to happen? I mean, it's kind of a weird scenario. You've got a candle on a plate, pour some water onto the plate. Obviously, you know, don't have it overflowing, but a healthy amount of water. There we go. It works better if you've let the candle burn for a little bit, which I have. And then, yeah, you stick the jar on top of the candle. What do you reckon is going to happen? Come on. 
predict with me. I can't predict because I've done this loads of times before. Which you might have if you've been watching for a while. I'm going to get, try and get this down so that it's on. You can see really clearly what's going to happen. Okay, here we go. Jar has gone on top of the candle. Candle's still burning. Candle's going out. Candle's gone out. Is that what you predicted? Candle's gone out. And then, look, can you see that? The water level has risen up. It wasn't, wasn't that dramatic. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been better than that, I can't lie. But the, the water gets sucked into the jar. Maybe that, that wasn't very dramatic. Luckily, like I say, for the first time ever, uh, I'm going to do a really big version. Although I've never tried it before, so it might be even worse than that, I don't know. But let's have a go. I've got this really big jar and I've made... <laughs> I've got some Play-Doh and an um, espresso cup and I've made a double candle. So I'm going to put that on a plate and put the huge jar on top. And let's see if that's a bit more interesting. Okay, I can reuse this coloured water so you can go on there. I think like the size of the jar related to the size of the candle makes a big difference. Maybe my jar was a bit big. Anyway, let's get this lit. So yeah, um, I'll go through the science of what's happening in this activity after this. It's quite complicated actually, but Robert Boyle had this vacuum pump and discovered loads of cool stuff with it. So he put a bell inside the vacuum pump and realized that sound doesn't travel when there are no particles, like in a vacuum. You probably know that because sound is particles bumping into each other and making your eardrum vibrate. So there's no particles, there's no sound, but this was an incredible discovery at the time. All right, yeah, come on, now we're talking. You better have a look at this. <laughs> I liked it, I know maybe some people would say that I should practice it, but I like doing stuff that I've never done before in front of you because then like I'm seeing it for the first time just like you're seeing it for the first time. That coffee cup's a perfect size thing for me to prop you up on, isn't it? Oops. Uh, coffee cup and a match. It's, mm, I don't know, maybe it should be lower. Sorry. Yeah, I want you to be able to see the water, don't I? All right, I'll just put you on. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Overthinking it. Okay, I'm going to put the massive jar on top of the candle. Probably don't try this at home. I'm going to have to be really careful that I don't knock the candle over. So, uh, jar. Yeah, okay, the candle is still lit. Hadn't thought about the fact that the top of the candle is touching the jar. That's not ideal. <laughs> Hopefully that's not going to crack the jar. Oh no. <laughs> so you can see a lot of condensation, right? Where... <gasps> wow! Whoa, 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 whoa. That was amazing. Sorry, I was faffing around at the top. Did you see that? Wow, that's so cool. It's still gurgling in. Wow. I'm not expecting that to happen. Okay, wait, we better do that again, Henry. Let's do that again. You've got to be really careful when you let it out so it doesn't sploosh everywhere. Technical term. Let's do that again, and this time get you to watch the water actually going into the jar. Oh, yeah! Thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this. If I wasn't doing this show, I'd have never done that. I'd have done, I've done this activity so many times, and I've never used a massive jar. Okay, so lighting the candle again. Terrible telly, sorry, because you can't see. I wonder if it'll make a difference that the inside of the jar is now very hot, I don't know. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so <laughs> that's the setup, but this time we'll focus on the bottom bit. Oh yeah, I've gone very black, so I'll... Look. Got a big black spot on the bottom of my jar. I'll turn the jar a different way. Uh, yeah. Okay, going on. Oops. Wow, straight away! Even while the candle is still lit. That's very confusing. Wow. Ah, oh, brilliant! <laughs> Even sounds gross. Okay, I'd better flip you around, but, oh, awesome. Um, 
Right, so that actually, <laughs> that really disproves my theory of why this is happening. There's a lot of, a lot of information online, some of it is completely wrong about why that happens. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting actually, that does completely change things. So, there's water, there's air particles all around us, right? There's air particles on the outside of the jar, pushing, let's say that that's the water. So air particles on the outside of the jar are pushing down on the water. And obviously there's air in the jar also pushing down on the water, which is why the water stays on the plane, doesn't like float around. Um, so the candle goes out because the candle uses up the oxygen. There's a chemical reaction between the candle and the air, uh, which uses up the oxygen. And when the oxygen is all used up, then the flame goes out because fire needs oxygen to burn, right? Um, so that's why the candle goes out. Why does the water get sucked into the jar? Well, just yesterday on Facebook, I said it's because the air in the jar uh, is warm and moving around a lot, so spread out. And when the candle goes out, the air in the jar cools down and comes together. So you get not a vacuum, but you get more space. So there's less air particles pushing down on the water. And that's why this force kind of wins and the water gets sucked in. That obviously, does, that's not right, is it? That can't be right, because we just saw that the candle was still lit while the water got sucked up into the jar. So I guess it's, I guess it's that the air particles inside the jar have got more energy so they've spread out more and that spreading out means that there's less force i don't know actually <laughs> i don't know there's one website i found that that does explain it and i haven't looked at it for ages and i can't remember what it says <laughs> i'll try and link to it on my facebook page the classic wrong thing is that um, the oxygen gets used up, so there's like no air in the jar, but that's not true. It's just that instead of oxygen, it's carbon dioxide, but obviously you're not taking any air particles away. Anyway, I don't know what, I don't know what I'm gonna do that now. I don't wanna move it. Um, so that was Robert Boyle. He discovered through his experiments that candles don't burn, fire doesn't burn where there are no air particles. He also, a lot of you aren't gonna like this bit, um, he experimented by putting loads of different animals into jars and finding out that animals can't survive with no air either, which is where this exquisite picture that I showed you uh, when you were waiting comes in. This is not painted in the 1600s, but it's a painting of, uh, you can see, right? The, sorry. Um, here's the vacuum pump. It's very, very similar to Boyle's vacuum pump. Here's the jar. They've put a cockatoo in the jar. Um, and this is like a sort of, a visiting scientist who has come to these this family's home and is showing them what happens when you put a cockatoo in a vacuum. Um, so these children here are very upset, like the older daughter can hardly watch, but you can see here's the dad saying, no, come on, pay attention. This is very interesting. Uh, this is one of the first pictures, apparently. You know, when we looked at Leonardo da Vinci, we were looking at how he'd lit up Jesus and, and that was very common at that time that you would have like Jesus or a sort of religious figure in the painting like bathed in light. This is one of the first paintings where uh, the subject bathed in light or indeed just the subject at all is not uh, religious. It's scientific. There we go. Not that those are two completely polar things, but you know what I mean? So, so yeah, I mean, interesting. A lot of, um, lot of talk on Facebook yesterday about where they got the bird from. The, I saw a lecture by the National Gallery in London who said that maybe it was the kid's pet bird but we were discussing how that wouldn't be, like, I wouldn't be good form. I was like, hey, do you want me to come to your house and show you some science? All right, have you got any animals around? Cool, it's dead now. Like, so I don't know. I don't know where the cockatoo came from. It's quite a rare bit. So yeah, Robert Boyle was, was the person who discovered that animals can't survive. You wouldn't have thought he'd have had to do the experiment as many times as he did, but there you go. Uh, a quick shout out to these people just before we go. to story time. Um, because... Storytime is about, yeah, the kind of 1660s, but to go a little bit earlier again, um, these two characters are very much responsible for the fact that at this time people stopped just believing all the books that the Greeks and Romans had written and started coming at things with an open mind. One of them is very famous, Francis Bacon. The other one, I haven't heard of him actually, William Gilbert. Um, William Gilbert is the one of these two men who didn't marry a 13 year old. So we just focus on him a bit more. Most people have heard of Francis Bacon. Married a 13, started writing to her when she was 11, which I don't care what year it is, is gross. But William Gilbert did, um, they were both, yeah, they were both people who said, do you know what? 
what we're doing at the moment, like before the word science was, in, this was sort of invented, uh, to learn about the world, there was this idea that you would just read. So you'd read the ancient Greeks because they were always right, or you'd read the Bible because obviously that was right, or you would just talk. So at universities, people would just have huge, big, long debates about the natural world. And the idea was that you would, you would discover new things by talking about it. Whereas these guys said, actually, I think you should not have any ideas. You should just experiment and try and not think about what you want to happen and just see what does happen. So William Gilbert um, was, did a lot of playing around with magnets. Do you know what happens when you chop a magnet in half? So you know how magnets have got a north and a south and north and north uh, push away from each other? That's so not showing them pushing away from each other, is it? Uh, but north and south attract, you know that? Different ends of the magnet stick together or push away from each other. Opposites attract, so a south and a north get attracted to each other. Do you know what happens if you cut a magnet in half? Just before we go to story time. If I cut a magnet in half, what do I end up with? Do you know that? Hard to do, isn't it? You can't really do it at home, chopping a magnet in half. Well, you end up with uh, two small magnets. You don't end up with one north and one south. So William Gilbert, was the person who worked this out. He also worked out that Earth is a magnet. You know, we've looked at how compasses were invented. Most people thought that it was maybe because like one of the stars was attracting the needle of the compass, or maybe there was a magnet like at the North Pole. But William Gilbert came up with this idea that the Earth is a magnet, amazing. He also had a lot of ideas that weren't correct. Like they thought that crystal was very, very, very hard ice. Kind of makes sense, water, ice, crystal. Anyway. Um, yeah, there's a there's a there's apparently a statue of him at Colchester um, Church. If you are anywhere near Colchester, go and have a look. Right, I think it might be I think it might be story time. We've we've jumped around uh, from the early 1500s to the middle of the 1600s, and that's where we are. So yeah, let's do it. Um, there's a lot of water and computers around. Stick my computer over here. I'm back over there. Slide this over here. Put that there. Uh, yeah, here we go. Right. <coughs> <coughs> right, just just fixing Isaac Newton's hair. All the hair in this story time. Have you ever started something and not finished it? Of course you have! You can't find out what you're interested in if you don't try loads of stuff. And you can't finish everything, can you? It's just not possible. So this story is about someone who was very, very bad at finishing things. Robert Hooke was an absolutely brilliant artist, inventor, uh, great at making machines, and he could never settle on one thing. His mind was always jumping around from one project to another project, which, you know, would have been fine. I mean, it could have even been a superpower, except that Robert Hooke was also extremely grumpy, rude, and paranoid about people stealing his ideas. He went to Oxford University, and he invented loads of cool things while he was there, but he didn't publish many of his, his ideas. So not many people found out about what he was thinking. Um, he became assistant to a scientist called Robert Boyle. You know, the scientist who's very famous for his vacuum pump. Well, Robert Hooke actually built him that vacuum pump. In fact, Robert Hooke was the only person who could use it. Uh, so he'd often end up demonstrating it to people on his own. But it was Boyle who got famous. Robert Hooke could just kind of never catch a break. Um, when Hook was 25, the Royal Society was founded in London. It was, and still is, a very important society whose members are interested and interesting people. They are scientists, architects, philosophers, um, coming together to share ideas and also raise money to support other thinkers. So Hook got a job working uh, for the Royal Society. He wasn't a member, he wasn't sort of one of the, the posh people, but he, he got a job, which was a good job for him, um, giving lots of uh, demonstrations of lots of experiments throughout their meetings. You know, kind of make the meetings more interesting and uh, give people something to talk about. Um, and during these meetings, 
a professional note taker, as is the case now, would note down what happened at the meetings, um, you know, for the official records. But Hook was so paranoid about people stealing his ideas that at the end of every meeting, he would copy down the notes to make sure that he also had his own proof of what had happened at the meetings, just in case anyone wanted to steal his idea. Now, in the 1600s, there was obviously no electricity, there's no internet, there's no mobile phones. People told the time with pendulums that swung, but these didn't work at sea because the pendulum swung around too much in strange ways. So the world was crying out for a way of keeping the time um, that was portable and didn't use a pendulum. This was incredibly important for navigation and obviously navigation was very important for taking over the world. So the person who solved the problem of how you tell the time at sea was going to be very rich and very famous. Now, when Hook was 25, he did actually solve the problem. He came up with this thing called a spring balance and he showed his work to the Royal Society. But did he publish it? No. Did he patent the idea so that no one could copy him? No, he did not. So five years later, when Hook was 30, uh, a person called Huygens published a letter uh, telling the world that he'd invented something called a spring balance. Hook was absolutely furious. He was like, but I showed the Royal Society that five years ago. Um, he went to get the records of the meeting to prove that it was his idea first, but Oh, the records of the meeting where he'd shown everyone his spring balance were missing. So he had a massive row with the person who took the notes, like, you must have sent those notes to Huygens so that he could steal my idea and now he's rich and famous. Uh, but because he hadn't published his invention, he hadn't finished the project. Hook had no proof that he'd invented the spring balance. And if you look up right now on the internet, who invented the spring balance, you will find that it was Huygens. That same year, when he was only 25, Hook gave a lecture where he said that he thought the planets went round the sun because of a force, and he described what sort of force this was. But he didn't publish his ideas. He just did the lecture, and then, like, that was that. Okay, move on to the next thing. Now, quite soon after that, at a Royal Society meeting, someone sent their book to the Royal Society for the Royal Society to read. And in that book, it said, I think the planets go around the sun because of a force. And it described the force in great detail. Everyone at the Royal Society was incredibly excited. They thought this book is absolutely amazing. We simply have to give this person lots of money so that we can publish this book. Everybody except Hook, who was furious. He stood up, and obviously we know this because someone was taking notes. He stood up and gave this really big angry speech about how this scientist had stolen his ideas. Unfortunately for Hook, that book was the Principia. You might have heard of it. It's one of the most famous scientific works of all time, and the person who wrote it was one of the most famous scientists of all time, Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton was actually really upset about Hooke's accusations. He was so upset um, that he didn't publish his next book until after Hooke had died. Like, we think on purpose. Imagine doing that. Isaac Newton is no longer working and writing books because you've upset him. He'd actually mentioned Hooke in his book uh, quite a few times, but he was so upset about the big angry speech that he took Hooke's name out, which is probably one of the reasons you've never heard of Robert Hooke. Hooke did do one thing that stuck though. He did see one thing through to the end. Um, he published a book called Micrographia. You might recognise this picture of a flea. It gets around on t-shirts and things. So he improved microscopes and then he spent months and months drawing what he saw and doing beautiful intricate drawings like this flea. <clears throat> the famous diarist Samuel Pepys wrote in his diary in 1665, uh, before I went to bed, I sat up till two o'clock in my chamber, reading Mr. Hook's Microscopical Observations, the most ingenious book that I ever read in my life. So there you go. Micrographia is still available to read in Kew Gardens, if you're interested. Um, but it wasn't really enough to make Hook's name, and he died alone in his bedroom, age 84. Soon after his death, guess who became the head of the Royal Society? Yeah, it was Newton. Which, you know, 
could be the end of our story, except there's one last mystery. I wonder if you can remember what it is. Um, in 2006, somebody was looking around a house in Hampshire to work out how much it was worth. And they found something in a cupboard that solves one of the mysteries of this story. What did they find? What did they find in that cupboard in that old house in Hampshire? They found Hook's own handwritten notes of the meeting where he told the Royal Society about the spring balance and mixed up in Hook's own notes with the official notes of the meeting. He must have accidentally collected the official notes up with his own notes and then instead of filing them away carefully, lost them. <sighs> so there you go. That's the story of Robert Hook. Was not finishing things his problem? Or was it his paranoia and his meanness? I like to think that if you're generous and kind, it doesn't matter too much if you're not good at finishing. Th the end. <laughs> ah, and that is my, it wasn't really about, I suppose it was the science of the 1600s. Obviously the 1600s like, lasted for a hundred years. <laughs> uh, so we've covered some, some bits and pieces in there, but yeah, we definitely have to do a whole separate lesson on obviously like Isaac Newton and the Civil War, which is amazing when the whole country started fighting each other. But that'll do for now. I hope you enjoyed this starter Lego Story Time show about what science was like in the 1600s and how things changed. Thank you for coming. So this is actually my last lesson um, before the half-term holiday. I'm just gonna grab my computer because uh, when I'm live, I always put a post up on Facebook saying, if you would like to comment, then please do. So I'm just gonna go to my Facebook page and see if anybody has said hello to me. But yeah, there's no lessons or anything next week because I'm on half term. Um, and then the week after that, I think we'll say that this is the last lesson on scientists and inventions and discoveries. And we'll go back to, well, just whatever you want, really. If you've got a good suggestion for a Lego Storytime show, let me know. Octopus versus squid is quite high up on the list. Someone has requested that. But yeah, if you've got any other ideas, I want to hear from you. Just go on my Facebook page to see if anyone says hello. So yeah, nothing next week. And then after next week, we're starting our new all ages lessons about flight. We're going to learn about pterodactyls and birds and hot air balloons and aeroplanes and helicopters and rockets and just anything to do with flight. Quite a nice way to combine physics with biology. I'm looking forward to that one. Um, yeah, and that's it. More free IGCSE lessons next term. Uh, if you are enjoying all this stuff that I do, you can pay me, actually. You don't have to, but you can. Somebody has to, or it wouldn't be my job. So how it works is everything is free, like all the lessons and the printouts for the lessons and the Lego Storytime show. It's all free, and people who want to sign up to support me with £5 a month. It's an incredible business model, because hopefully £5 a month for potentially like three lessons or offerings a week isn't very much for you. Um, but it all adds up to mean that I can have this as my job. If you sign up to support me, I will send you Theory of Science magazine. It's very good. It's like surprisingly good. That's the main response I get from Theory of Science magazine. Like, oh, it's actually like a magazine. I know, I'm my first degree is <laughs> not science. <laughs> yeah, I'm good at writing. And my husband, luckily, is very good at graphic design. So uh, just that has all come together and we produce this magazine for you. This one is about weeds. If you sign up with six pounds a month, you get weeds. If you sign up with five pounds a month at the moment, uh, you get, well, if you sign up with six pounds, you get the mold and the weeds. If you sign up with five pounds, you just get mold, which is also very cool. It's got a comic about how penicillin was discovered. It's got a free biodegradable plastic bag so that you can do a growing your own mold activity. Uh, yeah, so sign up with five or six pounds, receive uh, one or two magazines, and then you'll be on the list. And every time I write a new one, which to be honest could be any time, you will, it will get posted to you. Oh, look at all these comments, brilliant. Laurie's still here. You lost Flynn. What? How rude. Oh, Juavia and Ryder. Please do a Lego story on Hamaha, that fish with a really long name. And rocks versus stone. Rocks versus stone, I love it. You all want the something versus something. All right, rocks versus stone. I'm gonna put it down. We haven't done a fossil lesson in a little while. Oh, hello, Erin and Aria from Ireland. Awesome. Full science day here. We have progressed from science this morning in pajamas with breakfast <laughs> to science now while we wash dressed and with crisps. Man, what day? Joe and Emma want me to tell you 
we stayed at a lovely pink, a pig sanctuary in Wales. A pig sanctuary? Wow, why aren't there more pig sanctuaries? What a great idea. Ah, oh, Wales, beautiful part of the world as well. That sounds lovely. Relatable, I lose stuff too, from Hope and Aaron. Thanks, Hope and Aaron. <laughs> uh, flight, sounds good. Oh, the kids are making parachute designs for soft toys today. Oh yeah, parachutes, why don't you think about that? Have to get that on the flight. Is parachutes, is, does that count as flight? That is an excellent idea. We should do a whole lesson on parachutes. Yeah, we should. Yeah, because someone parachuted down from space, didn't they, not that long ago? Brilliant, thank you very much. Joe and Emma are still here, that's good. Laurie is still here. He's happy you have combined history, his favourite, with science. You lost Flynn to play in a cardboard box. Fair Flynn, are you a puppy or a human? I've just been assuming that you're a human. You might be a puppy. Although, obviously, humans do like playing with cardboard boxes as well. Can he say hello to Edgemont? He loves watching your home ed shows. This term, he has seen all of the live weather and climate lessons and Lego story time shows and is now here again. Edgemont! He's just been lurking this whole time for like eight weeks. He's just been skulking and you're finally saying hello. Hello! Oh, thanks. It's nice to know that you're here. All right, Arthur and Will, hello. Yeah, it's science day for Musa and Salah and Suki and Eunice and... Did I say Arza? I did, didn't I? Musa, Salah, Arza, Eunice, Suki. Right? I feel like I might have missed one of you. No, maybe not. No. I'm just going to own it. I love the dog in the wig. Oh, thank you, Hope. I figured just everyone was wearing wigs in those days. All right, Louis and Gabe. Science day for Ophelia and Imogen. Yes. Thank you. I will enjoy my half term break. Even though it's really raining as we speak, I am going to enjoy it. Hope and Aaron here. R.I.P. Bird. I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. R.I.P. Bird. Very rare cockatoo. Yeah. Anyway, right, yes, okay, well thank you very much for the comments. Have a lovely week off Theatre of Science. Don't think many other places are on half term, just York where I live. Uh, so you might just be having other lessons next week. But anyway, whatever you do next week, have a lovely, lovely time. Uh, I'll gonna get planning my flight lessons and I'll see you next week. Bye! <laughs>